Welcome to my thesis presentation. So my thesis is titled Constructing Adirondack Wilderness, A History of Misconceiving What It Means to Be Forever Wild. And my name is Jessica Hunsaker. So this is an image of the High Peaks region of the Adirondack Park overlooking many mountains, but one in particular is Mount Mercy. This visual of Mount Mercy and the surrounding environment is what drove New York State to formally preserve the Adirondack Park as an important wilderness zone in 1892, drawing the blue line border of the park and reserving the land just for the non-human world. In the new section of the New York State Constitution, Article 16 declared, the lands of the state now owned or hereafter acquired, constituting the forest preserve as now fixed by law, shall be forever kept as wild forest lands. In effect, New York had become the conservation state. Now, while the state viewed Mount Marcy as the epitome of a wild Adirondack space in the moment of the park's founding, it is less clear what wild or wilderness meant to the people who wrote, promoted, and backed the law in the first place. Does their definition fit with our modern definition of wilderness, or has the concept shifted over time? Wilderness is a complicated concept, and studying it through events that have happened in the Adirondacks reveals how multifaceted the idea is, including how it can change and continues to change over time. Plainly, developers in the Adirondacks have consistently understood wilderness as a place that is untrammeled by man by common and legal definitions. In spite of this, man has been trammeling the flora and fauna of the Adirondacks throughout the history of the park. Even drawing the boundary around the park and calling it a wilderness in the first place is an example of human intervention. So this results in a paradox of the way the people in the Adirondacks largely reconcile wilderness. It is both trammeled and untrammeled. In the Adirondacks, the concept has evolved repeatedly to fit with the economic relations that mediated the lives of people living inside of and outside of the park. I believe that we have continually misconstrued the definitions and ideas of wilderness as untrammeled land over the course of the park's history, and that wilderness in the Adirondacks has largely manifested as an economically mediated reflection of the needs and wants of people who see the park as a financial opportunity. Native peoples and poor whites, who were permanent residents of the park and troubled some animals like the wolves and black flies were excluded from the idea of wilderness. These people, who developing tourists also sometimes viewed as fauna, and animals were undesirable to the economically motivated developers of the park because they negatively interfered with the developers' profits. Our modern definition of wilderness as untrammeled or undeveloped, uninhabited, and uninviting land comes from the works of Howard Zahnizer, the man that wrote the 1964 Wilderness Act. The Wilderness Act is a piece of legislature that protected 9.1 1 million acres of land from human development by drawing boundary lines around wilderness areas and controlling what could be done to the land and wildlife inside of those areas. To do this, the act provided a legal definition of wilderness for the country to use as a baseline when protecting land. It defines wilderness as a place that is, in contrast with an area where man and his own works dot the landscape, hereby recognized as an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, who himself is a visitor who does not remain. Clearly, this definition paints wild lands as ones which are untouched by permanent human development. This framing of wilderness was directly inspired by the Adirondacks and the Forever Wild Clause. Howard Zahnizer's Wilderness Act and the contemporary American understanding of wilderness spaces and preservation are tied to the Adirondacks. Zahnizer actually wrote a fair amount of the act while in the Adirondacks from a lean-to near Lake Colden at Hanging Spear Falls. Zahnizer considered the Adirondacks so visually important that they drove him to protect similar undeveloped lands under the same precedent the park itself had been protected under. Between the writers of the Forever Wild Clause of New York State's Constitution to Zahnizer, legal definitions on what wilderness is seem consistent, that the park always has and always will and should be untrammeled by man. Unfortunately, there was never a period in the park's history without human activity. So how did Zahnizer get wilderness so wrong? Historian William Cronin expanded on the idea of recontextualizing our understanding of wilderness in 1995, opening with how, for many Americans, wilderness stands as the last remaining place where civilization, that all-too-human disease, has not fully infected the earth, and shifting to a question of how authentic that idea really is. Instead, Cronin explains, wilderness is far from being one place on earth that stands apart from humanity. It is quite profound at human creation. Indeed, the creation of very particular human cultures at very particular moments in human history. Cronin elaborates that wilderness is not a pristine sanctuary where the last remnant of an untouched, endangered, but still transcendent nature can, for at least a little while longer, be encountered without the contaminating taint of civilization. Instead, it's a product of that civilization and could hardly be contaminated by the very stuff of which it is made. Wilderness is something that is first vaguely conceptualized by man and is then executed by man. Man holds an ideal of what wilderness 
rather just means in relation to himself, and then he shapes the land around him to mirror his internal vision of a wilderness that is more so a reflection of his socially motivated wants and needs than of the ecology that was there in the first place. When one looks at some of the events that have transpired over the history of the Adirondack Park, with the popularly dubbed Forever Wild Constitution Clause, Zahnizer's definition of wilderness, and Cronin's recontextualization of our understanding of wilderness as a construct in mind, it is impossible to not acknowledge that somewhere along the way something was lost in translation, and we, by and large, have misconstrued the meaning of wilderness when it comes to the parklands. To keep land as wild forest lands forever is to directly intervene within that land, despite how that land is meant to be defined as uncultivated and uninhabited. With Cronin's explanation that wilderness is something that is not wholly wild by its own definition, and is rather a man-made construct, it becomes plain to see there is a contradiction happening here. The Adirondack Park is anything but untrammeled. There is not a virtual square inch of the land within the park that is wild at all. The New York State Constitution and Howard Zionizer characterize wilderness spaces as ones which are untouched by human interference, and yet the existence of the Adirondacks at all are a result of human interference as it manifested in its legal protection and foundation. The park's mere legal founding historically shaped the land, and the definition of wilderness by extension, to suit the needs of the people who visited, rather than the animals, plants, and people who lived inside. Tourism-based interference and the, the construction of wilderness took place across the history of the Adirondacks. In this thesis, I will explore two specific case studies of human interference that have dramatically affected the ecology of the space they were inhabiting as examples of this. Twice in the history of the park, tourist settlers have attempted to eradicate two important species of animal from the land's ecosystem. The Adirondack wolf was hunted to extirpation in the 1870s, and the black fly population was controlled with DDT fogging from the 1940s to the 1970s. Both of these actions significantly altered the ecosystem as intended, making travel to the park easier for some, and life for other living things, human and non-human, more difficult. Tourists who had an economic relationship with the park were the key deciders on what they wanted the park's wilderness to look like, and wolves and flies did not fit into their fungible definitions of wilderness. The same was true of the marginal residents of the Adirondacks, like native peoples and poor whites, who worked as trappers, loggers, and guides. They too became bound up in the construction of wilderness, serving the interests of the wealthy landowners who sought to domesticate the wilderness. The irony is that the attempt to preserve wilderness irrevocably changed the Adirondacks. You cannot return to the land that existed prior to the establishment of the Blue Line border. There is not a single square inch of the Adirondacks which can be genuinely referred to as forever wild, and yet this result is at the core of the idea of Adirondack wilderness, that it can be tweaked, renovated, or improved. In order to see how conservation changed the wilderness, we must look to the desires of the people who came to dominate the Adirondacks and the means by which they sought to profit off the land. From the 1870s, when Verplank Colvin first laid his eyes upon the view of the park from the summit of Mount Marcy, until my most recent hike to the top of that same mountain in 2019, people who see the park and climb its peaks consistently fall in love with the land and want to protect it. But who have these people consistently protected the park for, and what are they protecting it against? All right, so now we're on to the first chapter, which covers the 1870s to the 1890s and is titled 19th Century Sport Hunters versus Canis Lupus, the Adirondack Wolf. Wolves lived in the Adirondack region for hundreds of years prior to the establishment of the park. Tourists, who were largely a mix of highly privileged white, upper-class politicians and oil or rail barons, started visiting the park in the mid-19th century. This influx of tourists occurred in the wake of America's urbanization from the 1870s to the 1890s, which left them largely feeling as though their connection to natural spaces was crumbling. They came to the Adirondack State Park to get out of the city and hunt for sport. It was only after this first wave of formal visitors, drawn to the park in pursuit of sporting opportunities, that the new residents of the Adirondacks put new pressures on the wolf population. Wolves and sport hunters, according to the new residents, were in competition. Both were after the same game, white-tailed deer, and there was not enough to go around. For the new sportsmen, wolves did not fit in their idealized version of the Adirondacks wilderness. These new visitors were in the park to hunt for sport. If the creation of books by sport hunters for sport hunters like Wild Northern Scenes or Sporting Adventures with the Rifle and the Rod is any indication, and expected the park to be an abundant source of game. In order to keep the wolves at bay, the new sportsmen created a wolf pelt bounty economy, where poor whites, mountain men, and native peoples, all residents of the Adirondacks, were hired guns and were paid for every wolf they killed. Quickly, these bounty hunters extirpated the wolf population, and yet the elimination of wolves did not change people's views of the park as a wild space. If anything, their removal made the wilderness safe for tourists. So how was that so? Wilderness, as many historians have shown, is a socially constructed concept. The case of the Adirondacks in the Victorian era, however, shows that the constructed meaning of wilderness changed too. White and wealthy Americans in the 19th 
century believed they could selectively trammel a wilderness to eliminate undesirable creatures. This selective trammeling was mediated through a complicated matrix of new economic relations. As the park's internal economy grew and changed over its history, so did the definition of the Adirondacks wilderness. Wealthy sport hunting visitors changed the wilderness in the 19th century to fit their economic, social, and cultural needs. In doing this, the tourists drew in other people of less means, animals, and non-human organisms, and bound them up in the changes unwillingly. In creating a bounty economy around wolf eradication, these wealthy sport hunters started the precedent of constructing wilderness in the Adirondacks. Sport hunters were true patricians, ranging from small rail barons like William Durant to tycoons like John Rockefeller and even President Theodore Roosevelt. They came from urban centers around New York and the surrounding states to connect with an idealized environment of the Adirondacks. They built, commissioned, and patronized grand twig and branch mansions called Great Camps, where they and their similarly wealthy friends could away to the woods for the fresh air, but mostly to party and for sport. They flocked to the park for a chance to reconnect with some degree of wilderness. This connection to them was synonymous with trophy hunting. As deer were the most plentiful trophy animals in the park, reportedly one of two large animals that are numerous, they were often a target for these sport hunters. Unfortunately for the sport hunters, deer were also a large part of the Adirondack wolves' food supply. Believing that they were in a Darwinian struggle with nature, sport hunters fought with every means at their disposal to eliminate their lupine competition. These wealthy sport hunters were under the impression that Americanness was congruous with immersion in and dominance over nature. These wealthy sport hunters flocked to the Adirondacks because they believed the wilderness area had the power to imbue, connect, and transfer the strength of nature into them. They believed the land of the park was a place of sport where the hunting was good. 19th century authors and sport hunting tourists popularized these views in several works. This is best exemplified in S.H. Hammond's Wild Northern Scenes with the simple statement that, the game will be found as I have asserted, unless perchance an army of sportsmen may have thinned it somewhat on the borders. I found an abundance of deer. The drive to reach the Adirondacks was strong for many wealthy sport hunters because these publications offered information about hunting for sport in the park, which they saw as a solution to their insecurity about their identity as Americans living in urban spaces. The wealthy sport hunter's vision of the Adirondack landscape, which eventually prevailed, was that of a hospitable place. Paradoxically, the wilderness they desired was domesticated. They wanted to reconnect with what they determined to be a disappearing element in their identities as Americans, and the Adirondacks supported their rugged individualism by being a place where they could hunt deer for sport. Deer hunting was truly a game to these men. Evidently, however, it was a very important game. Eliminating the wolves would benefit sport hunters by preserving populations of deer for generations to come. Hunters could continue to kill deer and mount trophies and feel like an American indefinitely. This vision of wilderness is one where the sport hunters conquer the wolf to preserve the deer, exerting their might in a manner that displayed their right to claim the land for themselves. They were constructing the wilderness of the park into what they thought it ought to be, theirs. Wolves were much less dangerous to humans than the sport hunter's vision portrayed. The Adirondack wolf, as it is colloquially distinguished, is actually no different from its timber and gray wolf counterparts. The Adirondack wolf, just like Canis lupus, was a skittish creature that typically avoided human contact as much as possible. Like these other wolves, when healthy, they did not go out of their way to attack humans unprovoked. Much of the incendiary nature of the Adirondack wolves' reputation was fabricated. The same texts which romanticize their danger, such as adventures in the wilderness, also provide details on their cowardice and determination to ultimately be left alone. Here's a, an excerpt from one of these books that I keep referencing. To a timid man, there is something terrific in the howl of the wolves, but in truth, they are harmless as the deer, quite as wild and shy and full as cowardly in the presence of a man. They will fly as frightened from his approach, unless possibly in the intense cold and desolation of winter, when driven together and rendered desperate by hunger, they might be emboldened by starvation to attack a man, but even this is among the apocryphal legends of the wilderness. From Hammond's depiction, wolves appear to pose little threat to white visitors of the Adirondacks. They hardly even come across as pests. Hammond's observation confirms what modern animal studies have shown to be true about wolves, so how do we account for the views of the sport hunters that paint the wolf as a pest and an overall menace to their ideal wilderness? A look at what they more commonly read and wrote about wolves reveals a different story. Sport hunting tourists relish in and favored long, exciting, and elaborate retellings of wolf attacks. These stories often followed the same formula, as in Sport Hunter and author Heedley's account, the hunter raised his rifle and fired, but the wolf, making a spring just as he pulled the trigger, the ball did not hit a vital part. This enraged her still more, and she had made at him furiously. He now had nothing but an empty rifle with which to defend himself, and instantly clubbing it, he laid the stock over the wolf's head. So desperately did the creature fight that he broke the stock into fragments without disabling her. The bleeding and enraged animal seized the hard iron with her teeth, 
and endeavored to wrench it from his grasp, it was a matter of life and death. As a final formulaic note of these stories, the wolf is vanquished and the men are spared. In order to further condone wanting the wolf population gone, sport hunting tourists assigned a figurative role to the wolf as a pastoral menace through writing these stories. This, in turn, solidified the wolf as a conceptual territorial menace, which justified its extermination. As such, the wolf presented the sport hunters with the opportunity of conflict. The tourists, as a result, had to protect their identity by shedding the blood of an enemy attempting to take what they believed belonged to them. In order for the sport hunters to feel they genuinely claimed the park for themselves, the wolf had to die. The sport hunters themselves, however, usually did not meddle too deeply in the affairs of wolf hunting. They were there for sport, after all, and they were not exterminators. Sport hunters generated an intra-park wolf economy by paying locals to take care of their wolf problem. The wolf bounty economy was not particularly complicated, at least not on the surface. Wealthy sport hunters began asserting that they would pay for wolf pelts and scalps, generating a demand for dead wolves. This exchange is exemplified by this excerpt from Hammond. I was over on St. Regis Lake, hunting wolves and such other wild animals as they came in our way. The scalp of a wolf was good for $15 in them days, and a backload of furs was worth a heap of money. Sport hunters valued wolf pelts and scalps highly. Wolves quickly went from being a disorienting and occasional pest to a game worth stalking, but only to a select class of people. Native people's guide trappers and loggers were permanent residents of the park and were often classified as poor. They consequently became the primary exterminators for the sport hunters. Hunting wolves pressured guides into an economic relationship with the creatures, altering their relationship with the animals from one which viewed the wolf as mostly harmless and reclusive to monsters that needed to be wiped out. Upon the incentive of payment, guides constantly found themselves in vicious encounters with wolves. These guides had to go out of their way to instigate aggression with wolves and put themselves in positions of danger relative to the animals. And so the shift occurred for the guides. The once harmless and reclusive wolf had morphed into a dangerous predator that needed to be stopped. These guides were the direct primary actors in wolf killings, however they were far from direct agents. They hardly chose to kill wolves, and instead were pressured into killing wolves to participate in an economy that sport hunters forced upon them. Early tourists in the Adirondacks did not hesitate to dramatically adjust the ecosystem around them to suit their ideal definition of wilderness. As members of an exclusive group of upper and upper middle class white urbanites, sport hunters had the means to build their own summer camps, but also hire their own guides and eliminate wild competitors. Predators. Those who could pay to do so had the power to shape the landscape around them more dramatically to suit their wants. Even before setting foot in the park, many wealthy sport hunters already had a vision of what the landscape should entail. They also condemned the Adirondack wolf, portraying the animal as a killing machine which threatened not only any human settlements on the land, but the landscape itself. Most insidious of all, the wolves interfered with trophy hunting, outcompeting hunters for deer. Sport hunters paid guides to take care of their wolf problem with guns. Within a few short months after its official incorporation into New York's legal system in 1892, by November of 1893, sport hunters considered the Adirondack Park wolf-free. The sport hunters had done it. They had saved and preserved the immeasurably large deer population from the wolves so that they could hunt them themselves undisturbed. This act of preservation was made possible through the destruction of an entire species that roamed these mountains since the glaciers that carved them retreated. And after everything, wilderness was still the wilderness, regardless of the fact that the sport hunters had a keystone predator very rapidly eliminated from the park's ecosystem. In essence, what occurred was a preservation of the era's human understanding of land and all things that it should encompass. As the wealthy elites of progressive America pushed for the conservation of wilderness in New York State at the expense of the Adirondack Wolf, they unwittingly destroyed that very land they were attempting to conserve. And now we're on to chapter two of my thesis, which covers the 1940s to the 1970s and is entitled 20th Century Suburban Tourists versus Simulae Day, The Black Fly. As more tourists began flocking to the park over the course of its history, they encountered black flies on a more regular basis. The sport hunter legacy in the park lived on in the form of tourism, as the numbers of visitors rose well past the days of the rail and oil barons. In post-war America in the late 1940s through the 50s, road tripping became an affordable way for middle-class Americans to leave their cookie-cutter suburbs. Vacations became a more prevalent part of the lifestyle for people in the social class. To meet this demand, a burgeoning group of businessmen offering affordable accommodations took hold within the park. The tourism class was a mixture of descendants of residents of the park, like trappers, loggers, guides, and old resort owners, and first-generation tourists who came to visit and simply never left. These post-war hoteliers established more economical lodgings, like motor inns and campgrounds, than the great camps and sprawling resorts of old. Their new customers, however, were seeking the same thing from the Adirondacks that generations before had. From fishing to golfing to hiking to boating, their primary goal was to peacefully, at least relatively to their sport hunting predecessors, reconnect with the natural world. Things looked promising to the hoteliers. They could capitalize on the natural beauty they felt was around them and make money by renting out shabby accommodations through marketing that they were letting people bring their families closer to nature. A problem quickly surfaced, however, at the start of every summer tourist season. The black fly hatches in early June and bites any warm-blooded being it comes across until it dies in July. In this way, black flies interfered with the suburban tourists' idealized wilderness. 
Harried tourists often cut their stays short, telling their friends to postpone their Adirondack vacations for later in the summer. For the hoteliers, the black fly had to die in order to preserve their customers' vision of the park, a place where wilderness equated tourism-based economic opportunity and therefore had to be comfortably biting insect-free. Hoteliers formed their own associations and by the early 1940s had landed on a new answer to their bug problem, DDT. From the 1940s until the early 1970s, towns throughout the region hired scientists and fogging teams to kill off black flies, and by all reports, the program worked. With fewer black flies, tourists came earlier to the park, stayed longer, and spent more money. And then, seemingly all at once, the town stopped spraying. Largely thanks to writings like Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, which infamously portrayed the ravages of indiscriminate DDT spraying in America, townspeople largely abandoned the practice. In the Adirondacks specifically, some DDT spraying was stopped by environmentalist and activist Anne LaBastille, who convinced her property owners association to stop the fogging campaigns over their homes, drawing on Carson's example. In spite of a rise of environmental awareness among some permanent residents of the park, chemical pesticide spraying to kill black flies did not vanish entirely. Some persists to this day. The trajectory of chemical spraying provides a window into the way wilderness was viewed and redefined between the 1940s and 70s. For the suburban tourists and the hoteliers, just like in the 1870s, wilderness was a place that could be selectively trammeled to eliminate undesirable creatures. What those undesirable creatures were, however, changed over time to reflect the economic system that shaped the park, a system that revolved around the hoteliers and tourists. Black flies were there when the sport hunters were paying native people to kill wolves, but because the black flies did not pose as competition to the hunting that they were in the park to do, the flies could stay. The suburban families that visited the park in the mid-20th century, however, desired different activities instead of trophy hunting. They wanted to relax while reconnecting with nature, but black flies presented a severe obstacle. They disrupted the tourists' access to wilderness. As the park's economy continued to grow and change to suit the wants of the evolving tourist, so did the people in the park's definition of wilderness. Hoteliers changed the wilderness in the 20th century to fit their economic, social, and cultural needs, which were based off the economic, social, and cultural needs of the tourist. By spraying DDT, these hoteliers and tourists together continued the precedent of constructing wilderness in the Adirondacks and destroying the ecosystem in the process. The new generation of hoteliers endeavored to provide access to it for other travelers, particularly in the region around the town of Webb, hoteliers formed the Adirondack Hotel Association. It was this organization that proposed, sponsored, and promoted DDT spraying in the town of Webb. It was in order to drive out the flies to make room in June for the guests that the Adirondack Hotel Association and the town of Webb organized to sponsor the eradication program. The traditionally short summer season drove the hoteliers to support DDT spraying in the 1940s. In June of 1948, the town of Webb experimented with spraying DDT over part of the Fulton chain of lakes. The town hired a helicopter and a truck to spread a 15% DDT solution suspended in a heavy white fog in an attempt to add a full four weeks to the summer vacation season. Webb's resort owners and businessmen claimed that when the flies stay, the paying guests don't. As a result, the town of Webb continued the fogging throughout the old Forge to Eagle Bay region, where Anne LaBastille later lived, to which residents of Thandara, Old Forge, and Eagle Bay happily say they have never seen so few flies. Most notably, though, people thought DDT fogging was, reportedly, harmless to bees, birds, wildlife, and fish. This is true. Initially, DDT does not seem to be harmful because it does not reap any immediate visual negative effects. Long-term effects, however, did not seem to be much of a priority to those attempting to convince of the positive effects of their DDT treatment test. The hoteliers argued that the treatment would boost the number of visitors from 50,000 guests to the estimated 160,000 visiting the township each summer. Townsfolk and tourists alike were able to walk outside without being bitten, and early guests were not driven out of the mountains as in other years. The business owners of Webb believed the surrounding environment should be fly-free. While Webb's business owners played a large role in the decision to use DDT, they were not the only actors. They required a buy-in from its large customer base of tourists. Despite having the least formal agency in making any decisions, tourists heavily influenced the actions of the business owners, and in a somewhat indirect way, they voted with their wallets. In this way, hoteliers and business owners had to anticipate how tourists understood wilderness. These tourists' understanding of wilderness, interestingly enough, was informed by the marketing initiatives hoteliers used to advertise their businesses. Hoteliers and towns marketed themselves as pockets of frontier society in the middle of a vast wilderness zone, where suburban tourists could immerse themselves in a wild, natural playground. If tourists were drawn to the park for its natural beauty and its status as a wilderness, but also evidently did not stay after being bitten by black flies, then the hoteliers and towns had to adjust their understanding standing of wilderness to encompass this idea. In short, they fell into the same paradox as the sport hunters of the 19th century. Wilderness was a selectively trammeled space, where certain fauna within could be eliminated to suit economic, social, and cultural needs. The one creature that stood in the way of the town, the hoteliers, and the suburban tourists in the mid-20th century was the biting black fly. Anne the Bastille was an Adirondack environmentalist and author. She claims that, after years of streams being treated with DDT blocks to kill black fly larvae, the well-known ecological derangement documented in Rachel Carson's 
Silent Spring occurred here. Carson's work hypothesizes the future of places sprayed with DDT, where everywhere was the shadow of death, and that birds and animals would grow sick and vanish, resulting in a spring without voices. And indeed, in the Adirondacks, where DDT was sprayed, evidence seemingly ripped from Carson's works was everywhere. Her understanding and perspective around nature in the park was different from that of the hotelier or suburban tourist. She was not in the park to profit, Rather, she wanted to genuinely immerse herself as a woman of science in the environment around her. Because of this, her understanding of wild spaces differed from the more capitalistic one of her hotelier neighbors. Her understanding of wilderness was based off the flora and fauna of the park rather than the park's economy. La Bastille personally felt that insecticide spraying had massive repercussions on the environment. Black flies are, in many ways, just like other insects. They lay their eggs in water, where the larvae grow before they take off into the air at maturity. They're in the order of true bugs, or hemiptera, which are characterized by their forewings. In short, they look very similar to a housefly. In the Adirondacks, there are around 30 species of black fly, only two of which actually bite people and feed on human blood. Adirondack black flies do not carry diseases. The flies make up a large portion of the diets of fish, frogs, and birds, and therefore are a key source of food for larger animals in the Adirondack ecosystem. Hoteliers and suburban tourists likely did not have the scientific perspective of the biology, behavior, and ecosystem role of the black flies. Their only experience with the flies was being bitten. Therefore, they regarded black flies as pests. Companies like Monsanto and Montrose Chemical Company commercialized DDT in post-war America. It quickly became the top-selling chemical insecticide in the country and was manufactured on an extremely large scale. While DDT might have been widely popular amongst the masses, select groups of environmentally aware individuals were wary about its possible effects on the environment. Anne La Bastille was one of these individuals, and she played a large part in stopping DDT fogging over the Big Moose Lake area a few years before it was federally banned. Recognizing the threat to small birds, fish, amphibians, and drinking water, our property owners group agreed to prohibit the aerial spraying of these toxic chemicals around Black Bear Lake, La Bastille recounted. She claimed that fogging was ineffective, stating that, unless you're playing golf right after the spray plane goes over or are sitting on your front lawn getting doused by a fogger truck, the pesky critters come back to bite you a few minutes or hours later. After prompting her neighbors to write and submit a request to the town of Webb to cease fogging over their properties, La Bastille claimed that she and her neighbors within the property owners group saw very little difference in the concentration of black flies. Nature was a more effective pesticide, according to La Bastille, who argued that songbirds and dragonflies do a better job of making black flies disappear than spray plans and town officials. The United States banned EDT use in 1972 because of the works of individuals who put wildlife at the center of their understanding of wilderness, like Carson and La Bastille. This decline in ban was due to multiple problems, according to an article in the Adirondack Journal of Environmental Studies. The biggest problem was not mass insect slaughter. Instead, it was that there was a possibility of generally desirable animals disappearing. This was largely influenced by the reality described in Rachel Carson's Silent Spring and in Anne LaBastille's Woods Woman 2, where animals that people liked started to disappear because their food sources were dying. Studies showed that measurable quantities were being detected in birds, fish, and wildlife, as well as in soil and water. Animal and human bodies alike eliminated these measurable quantities very slowly, and as a result, DDT concentrations spread through the food chain of various ecosystems, including throughout the Adirondacks. Fishing birds were particularly predisposed to suffering from DDT concentrations. Today, we largely remember DDT as a horrific accident of a chemical that was sprayed with the best of intentions but committed a heinous crime, affecting one of the most symbolically important animals in the country, the bald eagle. Little attention, however, is given to the insect world and the myriad species that DDT wiped out. There are 53 species of mammals in the Adirondacks, many of which are omnivorous or carnivorous. Bugs are at the bottom of the food chain for these animals, meaning that bugs like black flies are the starting point of energy within their ecosystem. When the bugs are eliminated, the animals that eat them either starve or have to leave the area to find more food. This causes a domino effect that works its way to the top of the food chain and can result in eventual ecosystem collapse. In spite of Labastille's success over Big Moose Lake, chemical spraying to kill black flies did not stop in the Adirondacks even after 1972. Towns continued to eliminate black flies by spraying chemicals like dibrum, which took the place of DDT after its ban. Towns eventually abandoned these alternative chemicals for a more, what they call, environmentally compatible route for control through a chemical called called BTI. Scientists designed BTI specifically to kill black fly larvae, though the formulation is toxic to any alkaline gut filter feeders. The Adirondack Journal of Environmental Studies claims that BTI is a more safe and effective chemical to use in black fly control, and that because of it, finally, those of us who live or recreate in an area with the black fly see relief from the biting nuisance. It is clear that chemical pesticide spraying continues in the park to this day because people still hate black flies. Regardless of how safe black fly control methods are for the rest of the environment today, there is 
there's one crucial fact about the history of black fly control and DDT use that cannot be ignored. The DDT springs happened, and the bugs, which were not an insignificant chunk of their tier of the food chain, continually died with each subsequent DDT treatment. In spite of this drastic environmental change, before environmentalists began speaking up, no one seemed very publicly concerned with any possible long-term effects of DDT spraying, if DDT could possibly travel from areas where it was okay to spray into protected lands, or what implications killing a once humongous fly population had on the wilderness hoteliers were trying to pass off as preserved and untrammeled as a marketing scheme. In La Bastille's time, tourist consumption of nature was still prioritized over the actual ecosystem that people were coming to visit, just as it was in the days of the Adirondack Wolf. Despite how the town of Webb's decision to eliminate black fly populations was more easily quantified as an economic decision and not the result of a moral or perceived conception of nature, black fly killings still mirror a similar sentiment towards how the early sport hunters and the townsfolk and suburban tourists conceptualized wildlife in regards to their part in wilderness spaces. Both these groups of people and the killings of the wolf and the fly act as evidence for the idea that actual life in a wild space was not as important for the definition of wilderness as the construct of wilderness, which was economically rooted, was instead. Wilderness, rather, was something that was idealized and created based on human interest and convenience and not reality. If it was, then we would not continually get away with killing off masses of animals that directly interfered with the park's ecosystem and pecking order while still calling the park a wilderness area. We now transition into the conclusion of my paper, which looks at the 2010s and is titled Myself versus Mass Tourism and the Great Adirondack Parking Lot. Tourism continues to be the center of the park's economy today, and with it manifests clear visual problems that offer a similar window into a contemporary understanding of wilderness as the two case studies I have analyzed in this paper and presentation. Forest ranger Scott Van Lair is particularly public about one of the hottest issues he faces at work, hiker overcrowding and land overuse in the high peaks region of the park. Van Lair brings particular attention to a relatively recent phenomenon I like to call the Great Adirondack Parking Lot. In his 20 years working as a forest ranger, Van Lair claims that in the summer season of 2019, the park and its trailhead parking lots were the busiest he had seen. Some trailhead parking lots, like one dubbed The Garden by hikers, had been shut down. Satellite parking lots with shuttles that hikers can pay to use have been set up further away, where there is more space to accommodate them. Rangers worry that this overcrowding of infrastructure may result in trail overuse. With too many hikers on the trail, trails can possibly be worn down faster, and more hikers may be encouraged to wander off-trail where they can trammel local flora and fauna beneath their boots. Additionally, some hikers are concerned with how overcrowding may affect the wilderness experience in the backcountry. This offers a window into the way these rangers and worried tourists view wilderness. The field is supposed to be untrammeled land that is largely unoccupied by humans. Rangers like Van Lair are concerned that accommodating tourists through letting them park so close to trailheads may negatively affect the ecology of the high peaks, therefore negatively affecting the status of the high peaks as a wilderness. This is a shift in the way wilderness has been historically conceptualized in the park. For once, the popular understanding of wilderness seems to be based off the status of the ecosystem and not the wishes of the tourists. For this, we have to thank the numerous stewards and educators and organizations that have cropped up in the park over the course of its history that have seen the events of the wolf killings and DDT springs unfold and realized something was amiss. The examples of the killings of the wolf and the fly serve as proof that the legal and common understanding of wilderness has not been upheld in the park. From day one of protecting the park lands, we have set ourselves up for imminent failure. We decided that we wanted to preserve wilderness by not interfering with it when the action of preservation itself is direct interference. Worse than this, however, is the idea that wilderness at all is a marketing ploy that reflects the economic interests of tourists. Adirondack wilderness has, in action, never been about the ecosystem there. Rather, it has always been about the capitalistic developing tourists who saw it as an economic prospect. If the history of the park is any indication, tourism is not going to go away anytime soon. At this point in the presentation, I think we are all looking for answers and solutions to the park's wilderness problem. I propose, as a developer of the park who makes a living off summer season tourism, that it is within the best interests of those working and living within the park now to pursue a way to safely coexist with nature. From an investment standpoint, to not do so would be unwise. If our actions persist and we continue to follow the precedent of the sport hunters of the 19th century and the suburban tourists of the 20th century, then what wilderness will we have left to market and exploit? We rely on income from tourists who visit the park for its natural beauty, and actions like I have explained can only happen so many times before the land is scarred beyond fixing. If we look towards the perspectives on wilderness of people like Van Lair and put the land itself at the center of our idea of wilderness, we can break the mold and perhaps start to really undo the wrongs that have been done to the park's ecosystem over the last near 150 years. Several organizations, both big and small, public and private, already do their part to advocate for the land. From the Adirondack Park Agency and the state's Department of Environmental Conservation, who enforce laws restricting development on privately owned lands within the park and maintain the public lands for visitors to enjoy, to organizations like the Adirondack 
Adirondack Mountain Club and museums like Adirondack Experience, the museum at Blue Mountain Lake, that educate visitors on the ecology and history of the parklands, and to independent stewards who make it their mission to go out of their way to do good works by educating others and eliminating their footprint and the footprints of others in the park as much as possible, there are already plenty of voices reinforcing the idea that the ecology of the park should be the center of our understanding of wilderness. We need to lead by their example and continue pushing for their agenda, representing the land which cannot represent itself. Perhaps we should consider enacting the rights of nature as an amendment to the Forever Wild Clause. Perhaps we should educate more people on the action of ecotourism and rebrand our wilderness. Instead of relying on advertising the parklands as a place of sport and a recreative playground, we need to market it as an important ecological zone and promote mindfulness in visitors who are submersing themselves in nature. In summation, if we want to be here, we need to remember who and what was here first. If there is any true heir of the parklands, it is the ecosystem, the flora and fauna which have been here since the start of life in the Adirondack Mountains. Thank you for listening, and if you're interested in seeing more details, please feel free to read my entire paper. There is a lot more in the paper than I was able to cover here, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below. The following slides are just sources of images and text that were used throughout this presentation, so please, if you want to investigate any of these sources further, feel free to pause the video and look up any of these sources. I'm here today at the Mountainside Free Library in my town to answer some questions that I got on my thesis presentation. What inspired you to write your thesis on a historical and environmental perspective related to the Adirondack Park? So I'm from the Adirondacks and in the past few years I have experienced kind of a severe overcrowding problem and it's been pretty frustrating to see. There's a lot of traffic and there are a lot of parked cars to the point where hikers are being turned away from certain trailheads. Turnover will be like hundreds of hikers an hour <laughs> at some of these trailheads, which is absolutely crazy. I think that I've been pretty frustrated because of that. That is kind of what drove me to like investigate like the history of like human presence in the park and tourism in the park. For instance, to kind of speak to the overcrowding, the state is moving a very popular hiking trail up a mountain cascade because the trailhead is on Route 73, which is a major road through the High Peaks region. So it gets very busy now during the summer to the point where it's very unsafe. There are hikers that park illegally and it's dangerous for any hiker or person who's driving on that road because there are an excess amount of pedestrians where there aren't supposed to be. The state is moving the trailhead to kind of help mitigate that problem and put parking somewhere else where it won't interfere so much with like a main highway. And also this will help with restoration efforts for that trail because when there are a lot of hikers that are constantly using the trail, uh, it gets worn down over time and that's not good for the ecosystem on that mountain or in the surrounding area at all. The state is taking initiative to move everything and some angry hikers in retaliation decided to walk along the original trail up Cascade and they marked the trail themselves with that spray paint on rocks and on trees and <laughs> plants and things like that so that after the state officially moves the trailhead somewhere else and they take down all the trail markers and any signage that these other people who still want to continue to park even more illegally now because that's not going to be a legal place to park at all they still want to be able to do what is what they consider to be the most convenient um, route up the mountain. I just really couldn't fathom how disrespectful these people I thought were being to the park itself. Like they're coming here specifically to experience wilderness and the nature that's around them and yet they have absolutely no concept about like preserving that wilderness or respecting the agencies that are kind of there to regulate how that wilderness gets used. As it turns out this type of usage of the parklands is far from abnormal. Things like this have been happening in the Adirondacks since the actual founding of the park, starting with that founding, the action of that founding itself. And I kind of felt like a sense of duty to kind of bring this to light. And like, you know, since I was presented with the opportunity to, you know, do some historical research and write a thesis, I kind of took it as um, an opportunity to actually discuss this and do some research because it's something that I feel like hasn't really been talked about very much. All right, here's the second question. 
do any of the 19th or 20th century white American historical figures you've cited address the native peoples living in the region at the time or historically? I got the sense that there are probably references to individual native guides, but is there anything more substantial? Do you have any sense of how native populations in the area have conceptualized the region? Have their perspectives been part of any of these conversations, including the most recent ones addressed in your conclusion? So thank you so much for this question. This is like an excellent question, and I kind of delve into it a little bit more in depth in my actual thesis, but there are parts of my research that have definitely been left out of the writing so far and are hopefully going to be reincorporated at a later date as I continue to work on this paper. In terms of the first part of that question, I find one of the most concise but also terrifying <laughs> instances uh, of this happening in uh, Hammond, actually. His book is titled Wild Northern Scenes or Sporting Adventures with the Rifle and the Rod, and it was published in 1859. So in this excerpt, he talks about beaver hunting, which is very similar to wolf hunting, and it was actually something I was considering talking about a little bit more in depth in my paper, but ended up discussing the wolves instead, obviously. So here, I'm gonna read the excerpt to you now. In the times of old, when the Indian and his brother, the beaver, lived quietly together, before the greed of the white man had built up a war of extermination between them, this must have been a glorious country for the beaver. The lakes are so numerous and the ponds and rivers so fitted for them that they must have had a good time of it here for centuries. The Indians never disturbed them, never made war upon them. Their flesh was not needed or fitted for food, and the value of their fur was unknown. Tradition, speaking from the dim and shadowy past, tells us of the vast numbers of these sagacious and harmless animals which congregated in these regions, living in undisturbed quiet and happiness all the year, building their dams, their canals, and cities all on the ponds, rivers, and lakes hereabouts. They are all gone now. Like the beaver, the Indian who turned against him will soon be gone too. Annihilation is written as the doom of both. The wild man must pass away with the woods and the forests before the onward rush of civilization and history will soon be all that will remain of the Indian and his ancient brother, the beaver. Well, be it so, and who will regret it? It is a sad thing to see a whole race perish, wiped out from the aggregate of human existence, but in this instance its place will be filled by a higher and nobler race, and educated intellectual cultivated minds take the place of the rude, untaught, and unteachable men and women of the woods." This excerpt is rife with evocations of the noble savage, and I think it shines a bit of a light on how maybe some white historical figures in this time period reconciled the presence of native peoples prior to their own white invasion into the parklands. So Hammond references that native peoples who we know were most likely Mohawk and Abenaki, although that's never really actually referenced in I think any source from this era that I've looked at, at least not with any frequency, usually they're just referred to as Indians and not by their nationalities. Hammond references that they made no war with the land and they had no value for beaver pelts specifically and their interactions that they had with animals and I guess by extension the land as a whole was based off of survival and subsistence instead of like attempted profit. They're, they had no economic system whereon they relied on pelts. I think that like the way that Hammond tells us this very much like equates these native peoples with the fauna around them by, you know, calling the beaver their brother particularly, um, basically puts them on the same level as animals. So I guess like because of this status, the white historical players in the 19th century kind of believed that native peoples had to perish just like the desirable beaver and the undesirable wolf to make way for and as a result of an influx of like civilized white society. So it was understood by these white figures that the native peoples that they interacted with were really only good for bounty hunting, whether it were for beaver pelts or for wolf pelts. So that kind of doubles as an answer to the question of like how native peoples in the region at this time might have in that they were not engaged with any significant development or destruction of the land until they were pressured into an economic relationship by invading white men 
and it also kind of paints a picture of how white historical figures themselves referenced and conceived of Native peoples. As I continued my research, you know, and progressed in time forward into the 20th century, I encountered far less reference to Native peoples at all by some of the primary sources that I was reading. So today, I think that we might feel as though there is some sort of void left by Native peoples in Adirondack history that perhaps after the pelt craze kind of ended, there was no reason for them to continue hunting these animals to sell because there was no demand for the pelts. And perhaps they faded off into the woodwork and they left the park in pursuit of other economic opportunities, which I think there is truth to that statement, of course. However, I think we kind of misconceive that as the only truth. And oftentimes because of that, we forget that there is and was and always has been a native presence in the Adirondacks. I think it's kind of a common misunderstanding that native peoples were entirely forced out of the parklands at a very, early, a very early point in the history of the Adirondack Park. All Mohawk land claims were ceded, I think, in 1797 to the United States government, and both Iroquoian and Algonquin tribes that once inhabited that region fled as European settlers, started to invade in the 18th century. Tribe members who retreated to their own communities outside of the parklands continued to send in hunters to farm pelts because they were pressured into these bounty hunting pelt economies by sport hunters and wealthy white men. Because of this, I feel there's a strong manufactured sense of absence of Native peoples in the park. In reality though, there are still communities and individual Native peoples who live all throughout the parklands, and their perspectives I think tend to fly kind of under the radar because people are not conscious of their presence or they don't entirely care to listen or possibly both. Adirondack experience, the museum on Blue Mountain Lake, their director, David Kahn himself claims, and here's a quote, the institution has been influenced by the sort of general perception that Native Americans didn't really live here full time and that the Adirondacks haven't been Native territory, but that's not true. So in 2017, the museum began their attempt to help kind of fill this void and, and fix misconceptions of the history of the presence of Native peoples in the parklands. They designed an exhibit kind of dedicated to the involvement of Mohawk and Abenaki people in um, one of their buildings about living in the Adirondacks. So the exhibit itself is highly engaging and I think certainly well past due um, and it focuses particularly on cultural appropriation in the park but it also celebrates and kind of elaborates on Mohawk and Abenaki cultures together. You know it exemplifies how like the traditions that those peoples have interweave with contemporary life within the parklands. The exhibit however doesn't really I think shine much of a light on any consensus in like a community understanding of wilderness that any of these peoples have. I think their individual perspectives, which I imagine must vary widely depending on each of their own individual engagement and the tourism based economy in the park, is something that I haven't encountered explicitly as something that's being taken into consideration in the search for a contemporary understanding of wilderness in the parklands like I discussed in my conclusion. So hopefully this can change sooner than later. So here's the third question. As a result of New York State currently being on pause because of the coronavirus pandemic, many people are flocking to popular hiking trails in the Adirondack Park as an escape and a safe activity to fill their quarantined days. Because of this surge in foot traffic, many trails have been temporarily closed. Just for how long is unknown. What are your thoughts on the closure of these wilderness areas to the general public at this unprecedented time? Okay, so I'm gonna read something um, from New York State's website about this. So the Office of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation and the State Department of Environmental Conservation encourage New Yorkers to recreate locally, practice social distancing and use common sense to protect themselves and others. Getting outdoors to a walk, jog, hike, ride a bicycle or visit a park or state lands is a healthy way to stay active, spend time with your immediate household family members and reduce stress and anxiety while practicing physical distancing. While outdoor spaces and restrooms at state parks and DEC's public facilities may be closed to prevent community spread of COVID-19, parks, grounds, forests, and trails are open during daylight hours seven days a week. So the state is really encouraging people to go outside because it's good for us to get out of the house. <laughs> but 
to definitely stay local and to keep your visits short. That way people aren't traveling long distances. Essentially, I think people from downstate are not being encouraged to come up to the Adirondacks to hike in the event of a potential spread of the disease, which is scary to think about. So state land, however, has not been closed during the state's pause. Now, additionally, there are other trails and lands that are maintained by the Adirondack Mountain Club, which is its own separate entity. And here's what they say. They kind of just echo the state. They say that they strongly encourage hikers to recreate locally and individually during this time. Trails at the Adirondack Lodge, like I mentioned earlier, which is in the High Peaks area, are still open for day hiking and um, like restroom facilities. However, any lodging facilities that they might provide have been closed. As far as I know, some trail use has been suspended or limited by the Adirondack Mountain Club because of overcrowding issues. I know trailheads like Black and Buck Mountain and the Pilot Knob Preserve in Lake George looked kind of reminiscent to me of the high peaks during peak summer season, which is extremely overcrowded. There's a lot of cars parked. If the thought behind these closures is to maintain social distancing, that's a little difficult when you have a lot of overcrowding on these trails. So trails can be narrow at times and like overcrowding can push hikers off trail or encourage them to kind of investigate off trail to get away from other people. And this is not ideal, I think, for anybody involved, particularly the environment, because when a hiker goes off trail, you might not realize it, but you're actually like stomping all over microfauna and flora or potentially large fauna and flora on the ground beneath you. There's a reason that the trail is there in the first place. It's so that the area that's worn up the mountain or through the preserve or wherever it is that somebody happens to be walking is only worn down in a very specific place instead of all over. It can be pretty debilitating to the land for something like this to happen. I think that the state and the ADK maintaining some of their larger trails, um, like, you know, keeping them open during the pandemic is kind of their attempt at a happy medium. By encouraging local people to hike, they're trying to help, like, mitigate cabin fever and stir craziness and things like that. Land restoration usually takes the place of limited to full trail closures. Hopefully during this time, some unintended restoration can kind of occur on some of these trails, particularly in the High Peaks region where I think it's needed the most. So that concludes um, all of my questions that I received. And if you have any other questions, you know, feel free to continue to contact me with them because I'd love to hear it, uh, what you have in mind and your takeaway from this. And, you know, thank you so much for listening and watching and uh, check out my paper if you are interested in learning any more. And uh, thank you so much.